Welcome to another edition of Lakeville's City Council Wrap-Up. During this program, we will highlight the agenda items presented to the Lakeville City Council at their June 3rd, 2013 meeting. First highlighted item on the agenda is item number five, Public Works Department Monthly Report. And to give the background information on this agenda item is Public Works Director Chris Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My pleasure to be here with you this evening again for our May 2013 monthly report for the Public Works Department. First, we'll start with a facilities project, and it happens to be here at City Hall. Two of the rooftop HVAC units at City Hall were recently replaced with new high-efficiency units. The two replaced RTUs were original to the building and had suffered several key component failures in the past few years. So in May, uh, con contract crews blocked off part of our City Hall parking lot in front of the building uh, to make way for a crane that ultimately disconnected and removed, as you can see in some of the pictures, those are the new units, but disconnected and removed the old units and placed new units on the roof here at City Hall. In terms of efficiency, the new units have an energy efficiency ratio or EER uh, in excess of 11 compared to our old units that had an efficiency rating of about 8.9. And as you know, the higher the number, the more efficient the unit is. Uh, the new RTUs were operational within a few days of their installation. Uh, continuing on uh, with facilities and some of the equipment related to that, uh, during the past week the exhaust system uh, at our water treatment uh, facilities generator was refitted or retrofitted with an oxidation catalyst system to reduce the emissions of hazardous air pollutants. This upgrade is in response to a recent finalization of the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA's emission standards for diesel engine generators. And this is known formally, give me a minute here, as the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants for Stationary Reciprocating Internal Combustion Engines. Now these standards require uh, diesel generator users of over 500 horsepower to quantifiably reduce hazardous emissions. So the installation of the oxidation catalyst, more or less it's a catalytic converter like you have on your vehicles, is just the first step, although it is the largest, as you can see in the pictures, uh, in the whole process. Once that catalyst is installed, the generator's emissions must be tested regularly for compliance with these new emission standards. The results of the testing are sent uh, quarterly to the EPA. A second generator at our central maintenance facility is also being upgraded this week and these generators are used for emergency backup power at these two facilities and also used for peak shaving by Dakota Electric Association. Now in typical snow and ice control operations, of course, our goal is to always clear the pavement from curb to curb and not any further than that. Most of the time that's exactly what happens, but as we all know, roads are not straight and there are a number of external forces that act on our trucks as it turns and corners and moves around cul-de-sacs. As a result, the plow will occasionally ride up the curb and damage the sod, sod excuse me, along the boulevard area. These areas of damaged sod are logged by our drivers or reported by the property owners, and the sod is re replaced in the spring and early summer. Uh, replacement dates, of course, vary depending on when sod farms are open and when sod's available. But before the sod is replaced, you can see in these photos, crews go out and prep the areas. This means removing the damaged sod and prepping the area to receive new sod, as well as in the lower right photo, cleaning up uh, all of the old sod and disposing of it. Crews are working throughout the city to prep these damaged areas and we'll be following up, uh, and we've already started with some of that, but with new sod very shortly. Now moving on to some of our building activity and erosion control, over the past month our environmental resources staff has been very active in inspecting residential construction projects for compliance with the city's erosion control ordinance. The purpose of erosion control of course is to keep sediment from entering nearby bodies of water or from being deposited on adjacent properties. Each project is required uh, to have a drainage and erosion control plan that meets standards under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES, and the corresponding state program. Since the beginning of May, 82 inspections have been non-compliant. So once uh, notice is given of the non-compliance, the builder 
or a permit holder has 72 hours to become compliant. If the site remains non-compliant after 72 hours, the city can then withhold building inspections but allow work to continue or issue a stop work, or work order stopping all work on the project. I'm happy to report that of the non-compliant inspections, a majority of these are in the process of being re-inspected. And our last slide this evening, Hydrant Flushing, our utilities division, maintains over 3,500 fire hydrants in the city and annually exercises each one of those hydrants. Originally, this was done primarily as a means to remove sediment from our water distribution system, but now since Lakeville has a water treatment facility and our treated water results in significantly less sediment in our water system, hydrants are simply exercised to ensure their operation in the case of an emergency. So water from the hydrant is run through a diverter attached to a pickup truck typically and discharged into the street. You can see that by the lower center photo there. The use of the diverter helps to ensure the green space and landscaping around hydrants so it's not damaged by the water flow. You can see and illustrated by this photo some of the landscaping that's encountered around fire hydrants. Um, hydrants that don't function are properly noted and repaired and crews will be out throughout the summer so if you see them in your neighborhoods they'll be out uh, operating these hydrants uh, and exercising them all and repairing them uh, as necessary. And that does conclude the monthly report for May 2013 for the Public Works Department. Next highlighted item on the agenda is item number seven, Donnelly Farms 4th Edition. And to give the background information regarding this agenda item is City Planner Daryl Morey. The uh, location of the proposed uh, preliminary and final plat uh, easement vacation PUD amendment that's on the agenda this evening uh, is located just west of Dodd Boulevard, north of County Road 50 uh, and the Heritage Commons commercial development and just west of All Saints Church. The areas to be replatted from townhome lots to single family lots are identified in the red and it is the property that is a zoned PUD. It's part of the original Donnelly Farm Plan unit development uh, approved a number of years ago. As Mr. Uh, Walshlager noted, the, um, I'm gonna move this this way so it faces north. The, there was a previous um, plat that was approved uh, a number of years ago that converted some uh, of the townhome, the vacant townhome lots in Donnelly Farm to single family. This completes that action. These uh, lots actually at that time were under a separate ownership, uh, Royal Bank of Canada, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, the developer has been able to purchase those lots now and incorporate them into this replat. The proposed replat turns 42 vacant townhome lots into 24 uh, single family lots, again in these locations, this being the larger Donnelly Farm PUD of mainly the single family area to the north and east and predominantly the townhome area when approved was to the south and west portions. The uh, applications include the preliminary plat, the final plat, uh, a PUD amendment and also the vacation of underlying easements that are within the area being replatted. I'd like to touch a little bit on the PUD amendment if I can just to uh, kind of get a little bit more of a description of what, why the PUD amendment is being um, applied for and exactly what uh, is part of this application. The First of all, the conversion to the single family, from the townhomes to the single family lots is a main component of that. But the other part, and again, Mr. Walschlager alluded to that regarding the developer and staff working together to take what was a, you know, an existing condition and try to turn it into a positive in terms of uh, converting the townhome lots to single family lots. Uh, the area that was the most challenging was the area of the lots that abut the All Saints Church. And the reason for that is because of the grade differential between the church property uh, and the lots uh, where the townhomes were to be placed. The design of the townhomes in that area was such that the townhome buildings were going to, in a way, act as a retaining wall. The back of the townhome building was going to hold up the basically the uh, ground that was adjacent coming down from the All Saints Church property slope. Um, in the case now with the conversion to single family lots, 
there is the need to provide a usable rear yard area for all of those single family homes uh, to be able to meet the proper uh, building setbacks. And also in this particular case, there is not uh, going to be a homeowners association, association established for the single family. So you don't necessarily have maintenance of common elements. And one of the, the things that staff and the developer explored was providing a, a large retaining wall uh, adjacent to these lots along the rear lot line uh, next to the All Saints property. A Couple of issues with that is first of all, the retaining wall would cross over the property lines of a, of a number of those single family lots. And again, without the homeowners association who is responsible for maintenance of that retaining wall, that would have been a significant issue. The other issue is that you would potentially have had a retaining wall in excess of 10, 12 feet. And again, for a single family lot, that's not desirable. So an option that was looked at uh, quite a bit and uh, involved our engineering staff as well was to allow some of the lots, six of them to be exact, basically lots four through nine in that block three uh, to have slopes greater than three to one. Um, at the steepest point, it approaches two to one slopes. Um, the subdivision ordinance allows you to exceed a three to one slope provided the city engineer is comfortable and accepting of the design. So we looked at the options again, uh, looked at the design and given um, the stipulations that were being recommended by staff and are included in the development contract uh, and those basically uh, pertaining to um, the uh, stabilization of the slope on those six lots uh, includes an escrow and, and uh, city inspections. Uh, we were comfortable with, with that. So that's part of the PUD amendment as well, and the PUD amendment uh, being incorporated into this development contract for Donnelly Farm 4th edition. So uh, that is one, uh, uh, again, one of the actions that's part of this preliminary and final plat. <coughs> uh, final thing that I would like to just quickly touch upon is in order to uh, achieve for uh, the lots in that block to be able to achieve enough width for an additional single family lot, there is a portion of, and I'm sorry, it's actually in the, the next block over, uh, over here towards Dodd. Uh, the developer is going to be purchasing a strip of land of city owned outlot, uh, outlot B. Uh, it's uh, relatively small in width, 4.63 feet and about 110 feet in depth, but that additional area and width is necessary to be able to achieve another buildable lot in that row. Uh, it's an area that really isn't being utilized for anything um, in terms of the city uh, use of that outlot, i.e. ponding or, or trails or anything like that, so there is an ability for the city to um, sell this to the developer and an agreed upon price, uh, which is also included as part of the development contract for Donnelly Farm 4th. So that transaction would be part of the approvals, uh, again, assuming City Council approves the actions this evening. Um, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on the preliminary plat, the PUD amendment, and the easement vacation at their May 23rd meeting and unanimously recommended approval. There was no public comment at that meeting. Uh, and the Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources Committee also unanimously recommended approval of the preliminary plat at their meeting. Uh, so in summary, staff is recommending that the City Council adopt uh, the resolution approving the preliminary and final plat, which includes the development contract uh, PUD agreement, and then also a resolution vacating the public drainage and utility easements. And I can stand for questions. Item number seven was approved by the Lakeville City Council. Next highlighted item on the agenda was item number eight, consider ordinance amending Title VII of the Lakeville City Code concerning city parks. And to give the information regarding this agenda item is Parks and Recreation Director Brett Altergott. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Come before you tonight um, seeking consideration for uh, amending Title VII of the city code. Specifically, we were asked the staff to review 7-1-4-5, which dealt with alcohol in the parks. Um, and since we were looking at other ordinances, um, we also looked at some other ordinances that might have been outdated. Um, did we fall short anywhere? Uh, things of that nature. Um, so when, again, when we looked at it, um, 
with the assistance, assistance of the city attorney, we also made some recommendations for you this evening. Um, I'll just start out by just very briefly going through. Uh, if you look at uh, the red line version um, under that, it is uh, Mr. Knutson updated the classification of a city park. Uh, we further went in and deleted some areas of ultralight vehicles, uh, but still uh, his recommendation was to keep in some language in there uh, regarding uh, ultralight specifically um, in terms of like weight and, and things of that nature. But if you looked in our code, it was about a full page. So we reduced that. Um, but the area that we were really looking at is when we got into uh, 7-1-4-5, which was liquor. Um, it prohibited liquor in our parks our, and um, with the exception of beer that was allowed in the parks. Um, the issue before us was we have events in classification of parkland like the Lakeville Area Arts Center was technically under a special use park. So events like the Taste of Lakeville, uh, events like that probably fell probably a little bit outside of. Um, so our practice and our ordinance didn't always match up. So we wanted to correct that because we've had other requests for other festivals um, and things that are considered under the parkland. Um, so what we asked for was a clarification. So we're, we're asking that alcoholic beverages not be permitted in, in parks except for beer and wine. Again, there's a controlled amount of alcohol in those products. Uh, and then we went on further to, to make sure that we could have these type of events in our parks, which we feel are important uh, for community, uh, that the sale of beer and wine in a city park is prohibited unless a special event permit is issued by the city. And then it goes on and gives examples of um, who could hold that. Um, so that'll free up, again, Heritage Center, um, Lakeville Area Center, and Pioneer Plaza, Market Plaza, facilities like that. Um, so that, that was the liquor. Um, then we, we moved on and there were again some other areas. There was, there was um, as you get down to section four, aircraft, you would say aircraft, uh, but people have been requesting to fly model airplanes in the parks. And majority of our parks, although open, do have residential areas around them. Uh, so we looked at aircraft, we already addressed ultralight vehicles, we added parachutes, and then um, the Park and Rec Commission added model rockets to that. And as it was kind of funny because on the day after they reviewed this, um, we were, were, there was a quest, request to launch model rockets, about 20 of them in one of our parks. So I thought it was kind of ironic. Um, they got it done before we passed this ordinance. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then we moved on and we had just added fireworks. Periodically we do get questions, 4th of July coming, can I bring fireworks, little fireworks, sparklers, things of that nature, and we would prefer not to have that. So we, we clarified that and prohibited all fireworks uh, in the parks. And then uh, the last one was basically section six, dealing with noise in the parks. Uh, you get to a park like Antlers, you have two, three shelters, multiple events going on, and somebody will play their music louder than another and it just keeps going. So we wanted to find a way to combat that and it was just a general prohibition that no person shall make any noise that is unreasonably a noise or disturbs the co comfort and peace uh, of those around them. Um, and the Park and Rec Commission also went on to add to that um, that it, it would be in proximity to the park. Knowing some of our parks uh, and issues that we've been having, uh, the neighbors are right up against there. There's a basketball court and there's loud music going on that can disturb their private residence. So we looked at it into uh, any noise and an amplified noise. So looking at both of those, um, again, we're just trying to be better neighbors and, and make sure the parks are usable for everyone. So that, that is it, I guess the, the very brief version of the recommendations this evening. Uh, this was reviewed by the Parks and Recreation Natural Resources Committee on, at their May 22nd meeting. Um, and they unanimously approved it with the addition of model rockets and then adding language concerning noise and proximity to the park. Um, further, some other issues to consider that this is the first time since the 90s that we've reviewed city code in regards to parks. Um, and the proposed ordinance changes, um, addresses the current, the current needs of the parks today. So with that, I'll stand for any questions. Item number eight was approved by the Lakeville City Council. Well, those were the items presented to the council at their June 3rd, 2013 meeting. If you have any questions or comments regarding these agenda items, please feel free to call City Hall. The number is 
985-4400. Thanks for watching this edition of Lakeville City Council Wrap-Up. The Hawk here. Don't put grass clippings on the street. Leaving your mowed grass on the lawn is equal to a full fertilizer application. You should blow or sweep the clippings back onto the lawn so they don't get in area lakes or ponds. Grass clippings contain phosphorus, which is a major food source for algae. Feed the algae and you get green water. Remember to keep your lawn mowed high so that it can sustain drought longer. Keep grass clippings where they belong on the grass. Ha <laughs> ha!